Uh, some of them are a little bit different. Uh, they're not all just questions uh, that you're going to be asked uh, while conducting the study. As a matter of well, the first one, for uh, Deal with excuses Christians use to not be soul winners. For example, uh, does our differing abilities keep us from being a soul winner? Uh, sometimes we use and misuse the five talent, two talent, one talent parable. It's not talking about abilities. We we put that terminology on. I want these men to answer the question: Is every Christian supposed to be a soul winner? And if not, what's the consequence?
I'll just tell you what the Bible says. That, so I would say every member is expected to command to be a soul winner. It's commanded to be a soul winner. And I'll let Dale come up. Thank you, Ty. Thank you, Cliff. Appreciate both of y'all's lesson this morning. And it's an honor to be with you today. I'll, I'll try to keep this brief and say two things that hopefully will make sense. The first one is, I believe it is a responsibility of every Christian to use what God has given them to reach other people with the gospel. And I think sometimes we overcomplicate it. We get this screwed up looking at look our face and all concerned. I'm going to go out and go soul winning. Uh, I think that's maybe a, a misnomer. Our goal is to reach people for Christ. And the church has no business being involved in anything that does not be a trail directly back to the winning of souls. Amen. Many people that have. Now, I give a wide berth there. Uh, and by that, I mean we, we need to be looking for things that will give us opportunity to reach people for Christ. I was a part of a history club in the city I was in because that city was big on history and I wanted to reach people for Christ. I wasn't as interested in the history club as I was, I was in the people that were in the history club. I played on softball team before because I wanted to reach people for Christ. Ronnie and I talked, co coached little league baseball together because we wanted to reach people for Christ. If you clean up a building, a church building, if you cook a meal for somebody that's sick, whatever you do needs to be to trail back to evangelism. And Todd, that, the one talent guy, I'm going to have to study that a little bit more because uh, what he says is, at least you could have given it to, uh, invested it, and the interest, you should read all it, be used for God's kingdom. I don't want to be a five-talent man. I don't want to be a ten-talent man. I don't care to be the two- or the four-talent man. I'm fine being the one-talent guy that just uses what I've got to reach people for Christ. I think sometimes it's a huge responsibility to have a whole bunch of talent. I don't want to be that player that goes in and everybody expects me to be great at it. I want to be just that guy that goes in and reaches people for Christ. The simple thing. One thing, reach people for Christ. The, the second thing I want to say is that reaching people for Christ is a challenge for all of us. Ronnie, the question is about average members, so to speak. I don't know how many times I heard Dad talk about reaching people for Christ and how he would always try to take someone with him on studies. And for years I thought that was because he was trying to teach somebody who went with him to be a soul winner. And one night in the car sitting outside of a house, he said, the reason I take someone with me is if I know I've got someone going with me, I know I can't miss that appointment. And I learned that it was a challenge for even him who conducted so many studies for those who are not Christians to consistently go out and have to do things. Who we are first on the inside, 
changing our perspective, our outlook, our own natural tendency. Hey, you've changed the habits. You've changed the habits. Every one of us has people within our sphere of influence that possibly, possibly, only I can save. Okay? There are people that come into contact with Cliff Goodwin that I don't know. There may not be any other member of the Lord's Church that has the same influence on them that I have. But I just use myself for, for an example. There are people within the spheres of every one of your lives Cliff Goodwin cannot touch with a 10 foot pole. Cliff Goodwin can't do it. They don't know Cliff Goodwin. They don't care about Cliff Goodwin. But they know about you. They know who you are. They know how you live. And in as much as you will teach them, they know what you believe. That's what we're trying to change. That kind of perspective. You change who we are inwardly. We'll be doing the Lord's work. We'll be winning souls. Next question. How long suffering should we be with those who seemingly hear the word, yet would continue to rest or twist the scripture, 2 Peter 3 and verse 16, to meet their own desires and continue to reject God's word in so doing? John 12 and verse 48. Okay. We don't get to say. We don't get to say. I've seen seeds that I've planted that were reaped 20 years later. And I don't say that haughtily, but I mean, we don't need to say it. And my job, I believe part of my job is to wherever I go, to do my very best to leave that door open. I may plant it somebody else may water, God always give the increase. I don't think we get to say it. I think we don't need to be foolish with our time and our energy. But if I love somebody, I want to go to heaven. If they're 15 when they become a Christian, if they're 55 when they become a Christian, I don't really care. I just want to get them to heaven. And so for me to go around and say, well, I'm done with that one. I don't care about that one anymore. God forbid. I don't have any right to do that. So if I understand what you're asking, and I'm not being, trying to be offensive to you, uh, people twist the rest of the scriptures all the time. They're not Christian. We should expect them to twist the rest of the scriptures. Don't be shocked when people who aren't Christians act like they aren't Christians. They're not Christians. My wife gets disgusted and disappointed when those who are Christians don't act like Christians. That's what's heartbreaking. When well, people aren't Christians and they don't act like Christians, when they rest the scriptures, don't be surprised. They're a member of the Lord's church. They understand the scriptures. Be patient with them. Love them. Care about them. I, I don't know, and I may be really wrong. There may even be a time when we wash our hands off it. I sure don't want to be the one to make that call and stand before God and God say, you know, if you just worked a little bit longer, if you just been a little bit more patient with them, if you just prayed a little more for them, if you care for them a little bit more, they might have come to me. I don't know that that will even happen. But I'm just saying I do not see where I get to be the one that, that calls the game and say, it's over. There may be a time when I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give less attention here because here there's a great opportunity to reach somebody. But that doesn't mean I close the door here. I leave that door open all the time.
right. Two passages with regard to long suffering. Second Timothy two twenty four. The servant of the Lord must not quarrel. Be gentle to all, able to teach. Patient. Patient. In humility. Correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Patient. Serve the Lord must be patient. Remember, that person is in the grasp of the devil. And that's a tough shackle to break in many, times, in many cases. Think about the same book, St. Timothy 4. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Dale said that I, one of the first things that came to my mind was is that just because you let something rest doesn't mean you've closed the door. Planting seeds. You know, not everybody can be a purple whole thing. You know, if the soil's moist and the soil's hot, you can plant peas on Friday and they'll be broke through on Sunday night or Monday morning. Corn doesn't work like that. It's going to take seven to ten days. Over takes ten years. <laughs> <laughs> Over takes so long that you plant it again and then you have to hold it out because then it all grows eventually. <laughs> not everybody's the same kind. We're not all the same. And so, again, leaving something is different than closing the door. Now, in regard to casting your pearls before swine, let me make mention of this. I think that passage concerns the general Jewish populace and their attitude toward the Pharisees. <clears throat> in that you have the judgmentalism of verses 1 through 5. Judge not that you be not judged, and with what judgment you meet out of the meat, and then how can you see to take the splinter out of your brother's eye when you've got a beam in your own eye? Remove the beam out of your eye, and you can see to remove the splinter out of your brother's eye. Then do not cast the pearls before swine. I believe that the Jewish people lived their lives, religiously speaking, in constant fear of the Pharisees. And I think I can prove that from the statements that Jesus' own apostles made <laughs> time and again, particularly in Matthew chapter 15. Do you not know that you have offended the Pharisees? Pharisees controlled the daily life because they controlled the religious discussion of the day. They controlled the lives of those people. Jesus understood that. He even said so in Matthew 23. That which they command you to observe, do it. <coughs> do what they say, but don't do it as they do. Jesus is trying, I believe in Matthew 7, to get the people to understand that they don't render their religious service in order to be happy with the Pharisees, make the Pharisees happy, or to please the Pharisees. In fact, he says, if you do what you do to please the Pharisees, they're never going to be pleased with you anyway because they think they're better than you. That's casting your pearls, the good, you know, the, 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 the goodly things. The goodly things. Don't cast your religious service in front of the Pharisees. Pearls before swine, they'll turn and read you. Don't give that which is holy, your religious service, to the dogs. So I think Matthew 7, 6 is not in the, in the, in the context of, of, uh, of doing good to people that don't appreciate it in the evan evangelical or evangelism or the benevolent sense. I believe he's talking about trying to render religious service to make men happy as opposed to God. So, but that's my two cents on Matthew 7, 6. Hello? Hello? <laughs> tie in with what both Bill and, and Todd just mentioned. We've got to be wise in our use of time. Okay, If, if I'm beating my head against the seeming brick wall 
when there are other prospects out here that are more receptive to the truth, that's a no-brainer, right? But my temporarily diverting my attention elsewhere is not writing this person off or giving up on this person, okay? It's trying to be wise in my use of time. And not only in time, we need to be wise in venue. Wise in venue. What does that mean? There are certain circumstances or certain venues that if you and I set forth to propagate truth and it's necessary to defend truth, we're not going to be standing on level ground. Okay? I think of Romans 14 and verse 16 where Paul said, Let not then your good be evil spoken of. I, I don't want to try to teach someone under such a circumstance or at such a venue that the truth is put on uneven ground, so to speak, and I'm going to subject it to simply being evil spoken of without an opportunity to defend it. I think of one time years ago where some of that was brewing, and I was asked by some of our members if I was going to say something or write something. And I thought about it, and I wanted to. It had me stirred up as badly as it had any of them stirred up. But I realized that the antagonist on that occasion was going to have the last word. And there was nothing I could have done to have prevented that. I would have got to say my meager piece. And then it would have been lamb blasted ad nauseum with error getting the last word. And so in that circumstance and with that particular venue. I chose not to. I didn't want to do more harm than, than what good I felt like I could potentially do. One other thing on this. One other thing. I had a friend of mine, a good, good friend, a gospel preacher, who reminded me that people's hearts do change. We studied the parable of the sower. And we think about wayside soil and stony soil and thorny soil. And we know the two of those, it seems, obey the gospel and fell away. But that wayside soil seemingly never obeyed the gospel. And if you're like I was for years, and I had to be corrected on this. If you're like I was for years, we tend to think, well, if a person's bad soil, they're always bad soil. That's false. Thanks be unto God. That circumstances change in life. Things come and go. Tragedies occur. Kindnesses are shown. <laughs> Thanks be to God that just because someone is poor, poor soul today, it doesn't mean they will be 20 years from now. And I like Neil said, I don't want to write anybody off while there's a, gleam, a glimmer of hope. I, I used to say, and I still say sometimes in my invitation, as long as there is life in the body and reason in the mind, there's hope. Life in the body and reason in the mind, there's hope. Don't give up. Don't give up. And I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> all of these guys have influenced my life. But Dale has probably influenced my life as much as anybody as far as a, being involved in personal evangelism. He taught me this lesson 25 years ago when we were together up around the Hamilton area. And uh, uh, to say, I know you think I'm fiery now. I know you think I might be a little bit hard-headed now. You should have known me then. Amen. <laughs> and he still loved me, and he still, he still had patience with me, and he still taught me a great deal in, in relationship to these things. And, and I did debate him, uh, discuss uh, at length about this uh, concept of uh, what about casting pearl before it swam. Uh, Todd's uh, explanation is right on. I, I believe it. I believe it's right on. And uh, I think if you will study the book of John, 
you might be able to see even a clearer picture of that in relationship to the way uh, Israel is used in two different senses in that book. And, and you see the religious leaders were the ones that refused Christ. They're the ones he's talking about not casting pearls before because they had no respect for God and our His Word. Any other questions? Uh, this is kind of a follow-up on the one we just were looking at. At the end of the open Bible study, when they answer correctly and seem to understand, but they don't obey. The question basically says, you know, what now? Should we continue to follow up? You first. Yes, but as we mentioned earlier and as others have mentioned, you have to reassess your priorities. It's time to be looking elsewhere with some of your efforts, but it is not time to give up. Over the last 17 years at Ironiton, I have decided this. This is my personal preference. We don't always get our preferences. But I feel pretty good about our chances at winning a person's soul if we can do two things. Number one, if I can encourage him or if our members can encourage him to visit the services regularly. I want them to hear a regular diet of God's word, even if they don't obey it. I want them exposed to it and I want them to hear it. Now, if you get someone that's coming to the services regularly, and then I have the opportunity, or one of our members has the opportunity to do a one-on-one -on -one Bible study, that's where we've had our best success. It's just like they're being around the Lord's people week in and week out. Fills in a lot of gaps and answers a lot of questions that never have to come up in that one-on-one -on -one study. That's just that. They notice things about the Lord's Supper. They, they catch on to a cappella singing. A lot of things. It just fills in the gaps. Okay? And so, if I can get a personal study, that's great. I want a personal study. But I, I have figured out in my own experience, if I can get them to just come to the services, that furthers that personal study in so many ways. Now, I say all that because... If we've gone through a study, a series, they won't obey the gospel, but they'll continue to come, I get to continue to teach every week. Every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday that I can get them there, they're still being taught. Okay? And so, yes, you, you, you keep on trying, but you do have to re reassess your priorities occasionally, and you have to change your tactics. We ask a question. Sure. All a situation like that, it, even with your kids, you know, they're coming all the time, and you start trying to talk to them. You know, why? You know, why won't you be baptized? Why won't you? Be, can you not push them away that way? I, mean, I, I think what you're saying is great that you that they're still coming. But how often should you just you know keep asking them? You know, why not be baptized? I, I ask permission to ask them. I ask permission. I'll, I'll sometimes say, you know, if I close a study and I know the person knows and they don't obey, and, and I know they know and they say, well, I'm just not ready yet or something, I'll say, well, do I have your permission about once a month to ask you about this? And that's just how I do that. That may not be the best way, but I don't want it to be 20 years down the road and I go back to them and say, well, you know, I've been thinking about this, but you know, 20 years ago I had this study. I'm baffled. When you close a study and someone doesn't obey the gospel, I am just baffled. Uh, I, I remember well that question. I'm sorry I refer to my dad more than I should, I know, but he taught me how to teach people the gospel. And he said, You close the study by saying, Is there any reason why I should not baptize you this very night for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can be a simple New Testament Christian? And then dad said, Then shut up and listen. 
And I'm baffled when, when, when somebody says no to that. Uh, but I think uh, what the Cliff said is really uh, extremely important, that they be around the gospel, and they be around the influence of the gospel. I, I, Dad always said you, the key to baptizing somebody is, is well, I'll tell you the story. I'll be brief with it. But one night he was getting ready to leave for a study. He said, I'm going to baptize this couple tonight. And I said, well, how do you know? He said, well, I've been doing this for over 50 years. And I've never eaten in the home of an individual where they prepared the meal that I didn't baptize them into Christ. And uh, he said, they fixed a meal for me tonight. And I thought, well, why don't you just start inviting yourself over to people's houses for supper? <laughs> Make the process a lot quicker. But uh, I had that experience about three weeks ago. A young couple had been visiting our services, and I've been studying with them a little bit. And, and they invited me over for supper. And I remember thinking, I'm going to baptize this couple of night. And uh, I did. And when I started talking to them about some things after they became Christians, they said, we came from, and I won't call the name of a church, but a, a large mainline Protestant denomination in America, and they said uh, three years ago this church decided that they were going to ordain him a homosexual uh, priest. And they said, we loved our church. And they said, but when we saw that, we said, that is not a church that's trying to do what the Bible says. And we started looking. And they said, when we walked in y'all's building, they came because they had a child, and they had a child who went to school with some other kids from our congregation. And they said, when we walked in your church, the thing that impressed us the most is that everything that was said or done had the Bible behind it. And they said, the reason we came back the second time is when you preached, you used the Bible. We'd not heard that in, our, in any church we visited, which shocked me, but they said, we'd not heard that. And they came back. And Cliff, I think you're right. The exposure to truth, the exposure to, now you, 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 you mentioned this from music. The instrument of music thing is interesting because I think when people actually hear good singing, it does more to break down their barriers against uh, against being against instrumental music than anything else. Hearing good singing, uh, it's oftentimes not the scriptures that are arguing on the scriptures. It's when they hear good congregational singing that affects them, and I think that makes a big impact, a difference to them. So I think the exposure to truth, exposure to Christians, exposure to Excuse this expression, but our way of doing things makes an impression on them. And uh, we should do our very best to beautify the gospel because people are lost and they need the gospel. And they see in us Jesus, and then they want to be what we are. Brother, can I ask you one question? Yes, sir. Just for clarification, you talking about your, your kids? Are you talking about, are you talking about your own children, right? I'm talking about just, just them. I just took that. I mean, I'm not saying you talking about yeah. your children. I'm just saying in general, we're talking about dealing with our own children. Yeah. Um, the, to that part, and, you know, just anyone coming. They okay. They continue to come all the time. All right, because when, when you talk about dealing with your kids, I thought about, uh, I've got a brother uh, that's 21 years younger than I am. Uh, he was <clears> born <throat> on Tuesday. I graduated from Freed Harbor on Friday. Same week and turn 21 the next week, and so uh, so I've got a brother that was raised basically as an only child, and uh, and my parents uh, had been through the Fishers for Men program, and my my stepdad had even taught it some, uh, and they just were wringing their hands because my brother was 15 years old and had obeyed the gospel, and and I just told him, I said. Leave that boy alone. I said, leave that boy alone. Because he'd been in a Bible class. They carried him through the fishers of men material. Even in the Bible class at home. He was raised in a, in, in a good home. You know, both of them, my stepdad and my mother loved the Lord. Didn't miss any services. My stepdad was a preacher at a little country church son. I said, leave that boy alone. I said, not all kids are the same. Some kids are more... And I, I don't take this wrong way. Some kids are more thoughtful or more deliberate uh, uh, in, their, in the way that they approach things. And I said, the boy's been taught. He's seen the example. He sees it every day at home. I said, he's going to be okay. 
And it wasn't long after that that he did obey the gospel. Now he's 20, 25 years old and uh, lives in Memphis, a faithful member of the church in Memphis, just an outstanding, and I admit my bias, but uh, you know, he's just an outstanding uh, young man. I think some of this has to do with the fact that we see so many young people obeying the gospel at such early ages, uh, which personally, you know, my son was baptized when he was, I believe, 10 years old, my daughter when she was 13. My son actually obeyed the gospel before my daughter, and he was two and a half years younger. Uh, and, and the older I get, the less I become a fan of that. Um, because I think there's some things, I think there's some things that a lot of times a nine-year-old really doesn't get. Uh, but I'm not going to question anybody's obedience or their, or their children's obedience. But if, if, if we see a steady stream of nine, 10, 11, 12-year-old kids obeying the gospel, and our child is 13, 14, 15, and hasn't obeyed the gospel, then we start thinking, what have I done wrong? You know, what, or what is wrong with, what is wrong with my child? And, and that is, that is that, that's not the right approach. We have to approach our children the same way that we approach those that are, that are in the world. They're to be taught. Uh, they're to be shown the example of Christ in, in the home and in everything that we do and everything that we say. But ultimately, the decision has to be theirs. It has to be theirs. And, and I know that's the hardest one to turn loose of is, is, the, is the child. We've got one of our deacons. His son just turned 18 and has no baby gospel. He's a great kid, very thoughtful kid, uh, and and just to throw this out, I think there may be something to the Old Testament admonitions about the age of 19 and younger that, that ought to be ought to be given some consideration as we think about our own kids. Uh, that uh, you know that God didn't hold those 19 year olds responsible for the sins of of, of the 20 and up over the over the deal with the murmuring about the wilderness and the conquest. And so, um, you know, if, if a child's been taught, just do, do, we do the same with them as we would anybody else. They've been taught, and we just show them the example. You can encourage them from time to time, uh, but it's certainly not something that where you just want to you, you, you want to stay on top of it. And again, those are the hardest ones. I'm not saying it's easy. But, you know, I just, you know, I was, I guess, fortunate enough that I didn't live at home when my parents were concerned, and, you know, and I just said, look, leave that bull alone. Leave him alone. And it worked. There, there's obviously a point if you read for it and us and us. <clears throat> we see that in this fellowship and unfaithful members. And will you touch on that and, and, and about the <clears throat> people who have never Well, I mean, you, you, you were, we're not talking about apples and oranges, or we're not talking about apples and apples, I should say, we're talking about apples and oranges. Um, uh, withdrawal fellowship is not, a, is not an evangelistic matter. Uh, although, I'm, it's interesting that the, where I preach uh, on the fifth Sunday of March last year, we withdrew from Do what the Lord says, He'll bless you. We've, we've actually baptized more people since that time than we had in the previous years. That's those are not, I think that's just more about doing what the Lord wants you to do. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think there's a correlation. I just think it's, that's what you're talking about, it's just a matter of obedience. I could be wrong, Dave. You're probably not. I'm probably not. He stood up, so that means I am. No, I just I want to comment a little bit on this child thing just quickly because I didn't really address that. Uh, I was six the first time I asked to be baptized. And uh, I believe to this day I understood why and, and what I needed to do and why I needed to do it. And Dad said I was too young. So I waited to my seventh birthday and I went back and said I want to be baptized. And Dad said you're too young. I learned later why Dad was doing that, but that's another story. And at age eight, I went back on my eighth birthday and asked to be baptized. Dad said, you're too young. 
And so that Sunday night, I called a meeting of the elders of the Woodlawn Church, but Gary he said, I want to be baptized, and Dad won't let me. And I was baptized later that day, that night. So, uh, and I have looked back on it many, many, many times trying to think that I know what I was doing, and I'm 50-something. And uh, I have never looked back on it and thought I did not understand why and what. Now, here's a couple of things. I see your hand. Here's a couple of things. One, when your child comes to you and thinks they're not, and thinks they will be baptized, I'm going to say this cautiously, very cautiously. Put them off, and if they let you put them off, they're probably not ready. If you, if, they, if, if you say, nah, let's think about that later, and they go play with their matchbox cars and don't come back, they're probably not serious about that now. That's cautious because I don't want to plan in somebody's mind that idea and then that child's 34 and never become a Christian and they ask, but, but that doesn't happen normally. The, the second thing is, and this is, I tell parents this all the time, and I got this from a book that I think teaches false teaching. It's a book written by Jimmy Allen called Rebaptism. I don't believe in rebaptism. But he said something that was powerful, powerful. And I've used it ever since. It's been 20 years or longer ago that I read it. He said, when your young child asks to be baptized, have them write a paper on it. No matter if it's a page or five pages, have them write out all the reasons why they will be baptized and what they think happens when they're baptized. And then take that letter and fold it up and put it in an envelope and put it where you put your important papers. In your lockbox or your safety deposit box or your freezer. That's where some friends of mine keep their important papers. They're weird people. Put them somewhere where you put your important papers. And then when that child comes back and they're 14 or 15 or 16, they say, I'm not sure I understood what I was doing. Don't tell them, of course you did. Hand them that paper. And let them read for themselves what their 10 year old mind understood. Because a lot of times at age 50, you don't remember what you knew when you were. 15, or 10, or 20, or 25. I think it's extremely important that you write it, you have them write now why, and then give that back to them. If they decide to have it, they understand after reading that, that's between them and God. But at least give them the opportunity to know what they knew when they did it. Um, yes, sir. Thank you for that question. Uh, I'm going to answer, I'm not going to be a smart one, but I'm going to answer this way. God told me not to tell you. It's not my job to decide who's in heaven and who's not. It's my job to plant the seed and to share the gospel. And I believe a person has to be baptized and forgive us of sins to go to heaven. Your seven or eight year old friend, I don't know what God will do with them. I don't know what your seven or eight year old friend knows. I do know this. I had a good friend named Lynn Tall. He was 12 when I met him. Uh, he was 11 when I met him. And I started studying when he was age 11. And on our senior trip, when I was 17, he was 18. The last night of the senior trip, he came to the room and woke me up at 2 in the morning and said, Dale, I want you to baptize and I'm ready to become a Christian. I studied with him for 8 years, 7 years. And just, you know, by God's grace and goodness, we had the opportunity. But I commend you for caring about your young friend. And, uh, you know, what they understand and what they know, if they've got an authority voice telling them one thing in one ear and they're not old enough to understand the gospel of the other, I think God is a gracious God. But you keep studying with that child and Actually, help them understand. He's not now. I've met him at age seven. All right. Well, keep working with him, brother. Okay. Thanks. Well, our time's up. We need to get downstairs. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate that. This is this is good. Uh, we might need to do more of this. Uh, appreciate you for the questions and your genuineness and your concern about lost souls. Our numbers have gotten better and better all day long. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being concerned about the lost. And yeah, you know, I, I love you, brother. I love every one of you. Somebody came along and said, "Man, this is good." And I was thinking, "You think? Yeah, it is good." 
been good every year. We appreciate it. And we appreciate these guys that have been here for several years. Uh, uh, I guess all of these guys. Cliff, this is your first year? Okay. All the others have been used in times past, and we'll continue to use these guys. And the reason I pick these guys, and I'll tell you why, uh, they're great gospel preachers. Uh, they're good friends. That's not my opinion. I pick them because they practice what they preach. They're all personal evangelists. They're, they all take their Bibles and they go into folks' home and they study with them and convert them. And that's what you're interested in. Uh, I know you are because I get questions from you all the time. How can I talk to my mother? How can I talk to my daddy, my son, my daughter, my neighbor, my aunt, my uncle, whatever? Um, and in that respect, every one of us are trying to be personal evangelists, and I thank you for your concern. We're going to go to God in prayer at this time. Uh, meal is prepared downstairs. You'll go out these doors and down the stairs, and you'll be in our fellowship hall, and everything should be ready. Would you bow with me? And dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the day and the beauty of it. And Father, we're so grateful for thy love and the precious gift of thy Son, and through Christ, all men may have hope. We're thankful for the glorious gospel, for the power of salvation is contained therein. May we never lose sight of what should be the main thing in our life, and that's to reach all sons. We're thankful for everyone who's here. We're thankful for the food, the good ladies and men who have prepared it, we pray, Father, you bless the nourishment to our bodies. Father, help us always to be better servants. Is our prayer in Christ.